Amen. Good morning. Welcome. If you are, uh, if, if you've been out for a while or you are new, we're, we're, we're working through this series. In fact, we're about to wrap it up. Uh, Hear Her Roar, a, biblical con- or a biblically informed discussion on womanhood. And uh, it's been good. I mean, I hope it's been good for you. It's been good for me to rethink and, uh, and to, to, to talk with my daughters, to talk with my wife, to, to, to really think through what the Bible says about womanhood. Today's a special day. Uh, every Sunday's a special day. Today is a special day, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, ladies, if there's one thing that I've wanted to impress upon you, and, and if you're here for the first time, then this is going to be perhaps brand new. I want to impress this upon you as well. Uh, I, I've wanted you to fully embrace the truth that you are uniquely created as an image bearer of God. What I mean by that is you're not an afterthought. You're not secondary to man in his being created as an image bearer of God. You are crucial to the whole picture when we, when we look at God's creation and we, we contemplate what is God like? So God, God, when he said, let us, let us make humankind in our image, he didn't just stop with man. The Hebrew word for that is ish. He also determined, in order for, for me, the God says, in order for us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in order for us to, to bear our image fully, it is imperative that we also create woman, that we create isha. It's the Hebrew word for woman. So you are woman. You are like God in that you bear His image. And you bear His image in ways that I, as a man, do not, cannot fully bear. Lydia, would you stand up? She, doesn't, she had no idea I'm going to do this. Would you stand up, please? Oh, that's all you have to do is stand up. Okay. Uh, and then uh, this is my wife, Lydia, of uh, 31 years. Uh, old. No, we, we've been married for 31 years. Um, uh, and then uh, Emma, would you stand up? And Boyce, would you stand up? And Nolan, would you stand up? Three of our five kids. Okay. You, ladies, bear the image of God in that you create people. We, we men don't do that. Not in the way that you do. Not with the, we don't hold the capacity that you do. Three of your five children, they, they look like you, they, they, they think like you. You can, all sit, you can all sit down now. You're an image bearer of God. You create people. That is a unique aspect. Every woman in this room, maybe you don't have children, maybe you won't. Nonetheless, you bear that image. You are a creative being. You were you were created in the image of God. Now, it is an image, this, this image-bearing aspect of who you are, it is, an, it, it is an aspect of who you are that has been tarnished over, over thousands of years of of sin and, and, and brokenness and, and brutality and, 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 and what, what men have done to women and what women have done to themselves, what we as human beings have done to just, to just mar and, 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 and hurt and, and destroy who we are as a human race. Uh, in, in the course of thousands of years, sometimes it's hard to see that that image born out in humanity. It's hard to look at a man and say, that must be what God is like. Image bearer of God. Sometimes it's hard to look at woman and say, image bearer of God. It's been tarnished, is my point, because of sin, because of brokenness, because of rebellion. Jesus came to the earth, and Jesus went to the cross in order that the storyline of your life, woman, 
could be rewritten. And you could once again recapture that image of God that, that is in you. Now, the work that Jesus did on the cross to save you and to heal you and to forgive you means that now, with Christ, as Christ in you, now you are supercharged with the, the capacity to reclaim and and to live out fully all the honor and, and all the glory and, and all the dignity that is wrapped up in being. I think we have that word, Isha. The woman, for some of you, the wife that God has created you to be. Now, all of that, all of that is, is a preface to what I said was a special day, and that is Today is the first day that I have ever preached fully uh, Proverbs 31. Um, and you ladies that know the Bible, and, and some of you have no idea what Proverbs 31 is. In fact, probably several of you do, and that's totally fine. That's probably perhaps a better starting point for today. But if you are a lady and you're familiar with Proverbs 31, you probably, you probably groan a bit. Ah, oh, it's that perfect lady in the Bible. And frankly, that's why I've never fully preached this passage. Uh, I wanted to think through, I've wanted to think through what is really God's intention in, in, in giving us this picture. I've talked to a number of ladies who said, that this lady is a, is a bummer, she's a threat, because she's like perfect, and we're not, and what do we do with this? And I want to I look at it through a different lens today. So let's do that. Proverbs 31. Let me read it out loud while you follow along silently. Verse 10 starts with a wife. And what I, what I want you to know is, is that word, wife, is the same word, the word that we've already projected, and that is the word isha. Um, it's not spelled the way that we, we, we put it up there because we're using the English language to spell it. But, but isha... It's important that you know that, that that is the word for for wife. It's also the word for woman, and in fact, this this verse could aptly be uh, could aptly be translated a strong woman, um, isha hail. A strong woman is hard to find. It could be it could it could be written that way a accurately. It could be accurately. Uh, translated that way. Most, uh, most translations go with this, and I think this is also a very, very good, uh, good translation. Uh, but I want you to know that, because some of you are not married. You're like, well, what does this have to do with me? And I want you to know this, this passage here has everything to do with you, because you too are Isha. You too have the potential to be Isha Hayil, a strong woman. And then one day maybe you will marry, one day maybe you won't marry, but you still, there's still much in this passage for you. That, that's, my, that's my point. All right, with that, let's read. It's a long passage. This lady has a, is, 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 is described in, in, in quite, quite the detail. A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the mer merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her family for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. It's like she's a morning person and an evening person. Verse 19, in her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor 
and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with, sh with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come, at, at the future. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. And then the real pinnacle of this whole passage. Charm is deceptive. And beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Now, I want to be careful with this passage today. I... I'm mindful of the fact that you hear this passage and go, go, go home with, with uh, a thoughtful uh, opinion on this passage. Uh, it's, it's recorded and it's going to be online, so like forever what I say about Proverbs 31. And it's such a precious passage and such a precious topic. I want to be full of care in how I deal with it. And that's why I've waited to preach on this passage for, for years out of some intimidation that I want to encourage and not discourage you as a woman. This noble lady, this noble wife, she sounds like, like the perfect wife, mother, a savvy business lady, a warrior, a doctor, a chef, a Pilates queen. She probably still fits into her wedding dress. And the lady makes, can make us feel guilty or inadequate. Now I would ask, is that, is that what the Lord would have intended in including this in Scripture? And the answer, of course, would be no. No, his, his point, God's point in including this in the canon, the Bible, the Scriptures, the point is not to discourage, to cause you to feel inadequate. So, so I've sat on this passage and referenced it sparingly over the years, but, but what are we to do with this passage? And, and, well, if you would think with me for just a moment, what if this passage is a compilation of what all women have the capacity to accomplish. In other words, no one woman can do all these things, but what if, when freed up uh, by God's grace, what if women have the capacity to do all these things? And, and what, if, what if even just some of the things on this list are, are possible for you? If you are freed up from the limitations that... that that culture has historically placed on you because you're a lady. And men do those things, not ladies. What if by God's grace you were freed up from cultural limitations to, 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 really, to really thrive in your capacity? If you grew up in the church, there's a good chance that as a child and as a young woman, you were taught that perhaps if you wanted to please God and please culture, then your place was secondary. Your role merely supportive. Well, 
Culture in the 1950s said that, and so the church could align itself, herself, with culture and preach that message. But guess what? Culture has moved on to a no less demeaning definition of what it means to be woman. And so the church can either be stuck in 1950s culture, or we can say, what does Scripture really say about being a woman? In other words, if the church does not have our own thoughts on womanhood grounded in God's thoughts on womanhood, then we are super irrelevant in today's world. Backtracking for just a moment, going to a passage we looked at a few weeks, let's just review. What does it mean that Jesus said, or that, 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 that Paul said that in Christ there is neither male nor female? Galatians chapter 3 says this, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, uh, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, is this, is this denying the uniqueness of who we are as men and who we are as women? No, of course not. I've, I've spent the last four weeks talking about the uniqueness of womanhood. But what this passage does say is that in God's eyes, Men and women are, are equal. As God is redeeming His creation, remember I said that, that we barely even uh, bear God's image today because it's so broken, it's so tarnished, it's, it's, it, 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 it's so fractured. But God, as He is redeeming us, as He is, is, is rewriting the storyline of our lives, as He is is, is redeeming His creation. Heaven, our future for eternity, is sometimes called the new creation. As God is redeeming His creation, part of that is that misogyny is being defeated. And one day will be completely defeated. Abuse of women and, and the taking advantage of women, that is being defeated. And one day in God's new creation, when it is fully, fully unveiled, that will be completely defeated. Women, the social and political advantages of being male in a patriarchal culture, they're now available to you. I believe that's what it means when... When Paul says that, that in Christ, in the church, there is neither male nor female. We're on equal footing. Men may still fight to reserve their exclusive privilege in culture, even though we, we, we try to pretend like that no longer happens. But men, we still fight to reserve our exclusive privilege privilege as men in culture, but God is building a new kingdom in which all of the rights and all the privileges, privileges are available to all His children equally. That is what heaven will be like. You're made in God's image. Now, if all that is true, then think of, think of this list, uh, this, this, this description of this Proverbs 31. Think of it as a list of, a description of the capacity of womanhood. You're never going to be all of these things all of the time, and I don't think that's even the point, but you have the capacity to achieve way more than you give yourself credit for. It, it, it strikes me, it jumps off the page uh, for me the fact that, that the woman in this passage is described in such heroic terms. Uh, in, some, in, so, in some ways, even she's described as a, as a fighter or a soldier or a warrior. Terms such as 
Uh, the woman is, a, is of noble character. The, the woman is one with, with strong arms. She's described as one who laughs at a winter storm. She doesn't fear the future. The, the woman in this passage, she is a supplier of goods to merchant ships. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and, and her, her children put her on their shoulder. They, they call her blessed, and, and she, sub, she uh, generates substantial income for the family. She engages in manual labor. She scorns mere physical beauty. And yet, we, we can't get around the fact that she also, she sews, she cooks, she, she helps her husband. Sometimes she, she stands in the, in the shadows while he gets the credit. You know what this is called? This is called a generalist. And I, I, I bring this up because um, I think some ladies need to be freed up to, to excel as generalists. You historically have been called on to be a generalist. And I think this, this uh, description of, of, of this woman, this Isha, highlights that uniqueness of who you are as a as a generalist, uh, let me say it this way. Working outside of the home has historically turned uh, men into specialists. I might be able to do like one or two things well, but all these other things, I am like helpless. And without Lydia, I'd be like living under a bridge. There are many, many things that she does well, and you see that in this passage. But does it mean that you are, you are uh, called to try to accomplish all of these things at once? No, of course not. You are a generalist. There's no time for like, picking one thing and saying, I'm going to do this one thing in my life for the rest of my life only. Because for many of you, you've chosen, or for some of you, you've chosen to be a homemaker, and there's no time to be a specialist. This woman actually, not the woman in Proverbs, but the, the homemaker woman that I'm speaking of, she, she has like a dozen things to do at once. A, a, uh, a poet said it like this, just one line. He said, she, Isha, does not give her best, but rather she gives all. And that can be messy at times. That can be difficult at times. The point is, if you ever feel like, ugh, I'm just not excellent at that one thing. Like, what is my one thing? Remember, when specialists give their best, you give your all. Again, this passage is not a description of superwoman, but is a compilation of every woman, the potential in you that Jesus can awaken, the potential in you that Jesus can supercharge. Jesus has come to redeem in you this image-bearing Isha that God had intended from the beginning. All right. Rather than guilt you with like this skill, like you can meet the merchant ships at the port of Brownsville, or this skill, or this, you can wake up early and go to, and go to bed late, doesn't that sound great? Rather than talking about all the different skills, I, I want to focus on three or four character traits that I think you might want to you might want to uh, strive for. I'll start with this. Let me ask you. Are there things you have the capacity to achieve which you have not yet attempted? Think on that as we go through these character traits. Are there things you have the capacity 
to achieve. Never mind, are, am I like this lady in the Bible or not? No. Are there things you have the capacity to achieve which you have not yet attempted? Okay, so let's talk about just some character traits, just a few that this lady seems to have. And the first one we're going to deal with, before I even give you the phrase, let's say this, or let me say this. The first big issue that I just jumps out of the, off the page at me in this woman's life is the issue of, of fear. So this first idea is this. This woman, she fears nothing except the Lord. We get this backwards, don't we? And uh, this, is, this is a sermon series on womanhood, but, but we men, we can lean in on this because like, we, we hide it well, but boy, do we struggle with fear also. The, the woman in this passage, she doesn't fear anything except the Lord, and, and we so get this backwards. We fear everything except the Lord. We fear that next month this might happen or next year that might not happen or ultimately things won't come through. This is a major big issue in our lives as Christians. We hide it well. We don't want to admit it. This Proverbs 31 woman, she attempts to defeat crippling fear and she braces a different kind of fear. Women, if there is one, and this is true of, of men as well, but women, if there is one broken tendency I see in Christian women, it is crippling fear. This woman has, has, is doing her best to, to overcome her anxiety. Not that she doesn't struggle with anxiety, not that she doesn't have any anxiety, but she's working on it. She, she, she's, she's, she is wanting to get better. She is working on getting better. And as a result, it says that she's, she's prepared for winter. She's prepared for rough weather. She, she laughs at the future. I really believe that, that in our lives, God cannot work in tandem with fear. Because fear paralyzes. Fear stops us in our tracks. We, 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 we no longer gain any ground in life. What I want to call you ladies to out of this passage is, is a, a lifestyle of advance, of, of charge, of moving forward. And, and, and the thing about fear, it turns... Uh, it turns a life of advance into a life of retreat. It does it every time. It, it, it does it all the time. It, it turns a lifestyle of advance into a lifestyle of retreat. And it's a precious topic, and it's a topic like, oh, I don't want, I don't want, to, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings about talking about it, but we should really embrace the fact that much of our fear, if not most of our fear, is not legitimate. Mark Twain once said, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which have never happened. And I think we can embrace the same, the same sort of mentality that, you know, I've spent a lifetime struggling with fears that things might happen which never actually even happened, but how much of my life did those fears rob from me? Last year, I, I read this study. I, I, I can, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to see it in more detail, ask me later, and I can, I can send you a link. But the, there, there was a study that was done uh, that that said that 90 percent of what you fear. What we as, as humans, in, human beings in the United States fear, 90% of what we fear never comes to pass. 7% of what we fear comes to pass, but 
but works itself out such that it's not a problem at all. If you're a mathematician, you know we got 3% left there, but something in this study, something like 2 to 3% of all, you know, if we worry about 100 things over the course of our life, like two or three of those things may be legitimate concerns. Why do I tell you that? Because I really do, do believe that fear is manageable. I really do believe that Jesus wants to carry you through to the other side of your paralyzing fear. How you manage fear in your life will define the course of your life. And this, this woman in this, in this passage, she's done a lot of cool things, made a lot of money, apparently made a lot of clothing, but her crowning achievement is not all the things that she has done. Her crowning achievement in verse 30 says this, she realizes that charm is deceptive. She realizes that beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord. The implication doesn't fear all that other stuff. The woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. In a culture where women fear, it's a sensitive topic, but in a, in, a, in a culture where women fear, in some cases, this is their greatest fear. Fear of growing old and irrelevant because of physical appearance. You're like your greatest fear might be your aging self. Into that backdrop, into that context, God says all of that is... It's, it's fleeting. It's, it's, it's deceptive. It's, it's temporary. We culturally, we have robbed women of this, this defining role of fearing nothing but the Lord. We have robbed them of it by sexualizing them. In, this, in the day in which this proverb was written, um, all other literature, that's a I'm using hyperbole there, but, but not by much. I'm going to go ahead and use that phrase. In that day, when this 31st proverb was written, in that day, all, or largely all other literature, when, it, when, 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 when that literature would address women, uh, they, were, they were largely sexualized, but not in this passage. In that day, in that day, in every other aspect of every other type of literature, men were the vision casters. But, but in the Bible, in Proverbs 31, the, the woman is dignified. She's esteemed. She's lifted up. She's, she's fearless. She is capable. Jesus saw this same potential in women. He lived in a misogynistic culture. He lived in a culture in which women were just merely helpers. And we looked at the passage weeks ago, but if you weren't here, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that there's this, there's this beautiful and somewhat cryptic sort of paragraph in, in the Gospels that, that, that speaks of how Jesus' ministry... He and his 12, 12 apostles' ministry, because that costs money, was funded by wealthy women. Even in that day, Jesus saw potential in women, in vision-casting women, because Isha is a visionary. She fears the Lord. She doesn't fear the winter. She, she doesn't fear the coming winter. She laughs at the future. Three just quick, quick thoughts. Maybe, maybe this will be helpful to you. Three quick thoughts on how you might begin addressing your fear. And guys, again, hope you're leaning, hope you're leaning in as well. Three, three, three steps. These are mine. You could 
take them or leave them, but I, I want to give just, just a minute or two to this. Number one, if we're going to overcome fear, I think we have to admit fear is doing me no good because some of us just wallow in our fear. And we like worry about worry and we fear, fear, fear. I think number, step number one, you're going to have to admit fear is doing me no good. I'm going to close shop on the space that I have created for fear. If that's you, you know what I mean. If you have created some space in your life for fear, you have to close shop on that. Step number two, I'm going to create a new space, and that is a space for thankfulness. And that is a space where I live, where I, where I, where I go, and I say, the Lord has been good. I am thankful God has provided. I, I've, I've always had what I need. I'm, I'm well. The, the, the Lord has been faithful. Every good and perfect gift that I have comes from the Lord. I'm, I'm going to live in a new space, a space of thankfulness. And then I think the third step is I'm going to believe, I'm going to believe that in God's kingdom, even if I lose, I win. What in the world does that mean? Here's what I mean by that. Of those hundred things, of those hundred things that I fear, 90% of them or 90 of those 100 things never, never come to pass. And then seven of those things, they come to pass, and they work themselves out. And then there's two or three other things. And let's say one of those things actually happens. And it drops me to my knees for a while. Maybe it kills me. The beauty of being a Christ follower is that we know that we are purpose-built for eternity, that this, this world and this life that I live, it's, it's momentary. It's, it's relatively short. Even if I do lose, as a, as a child of the living God, as a Christ follower, I have a different perspective. I have a, a different take on life. I have a, a future and a home for eternity and, and, and there's great power in realizing and believing that in God's kingdom, even if I lose, I win. Final thing on fear. You will, you will never just naturally drift out of a life of fear. It takes work every day to get out of, to, to, to escape a life of fear. You... Without, work on, without, without hard work, we, will, we tend to drift into a pattern of fear. You will never just naturally drift out of this pattern. So, so talk to the fear in your life. Meet it head on. This will create a God confidence in you. The rest of these, the rest of these thoughts we're going to move through pretty quickly. Number two, um, this woman, she is strong and eager to make her family strong. Again, this is the, the capacity within you, woman. She loves hard work. Have you ever watched as, as your wife or your mom gives birth or cleans up a, a newborn baby or makes a meal or washes every window in the house in like two hours. Like when I take on projects that my wife takes on, like for me, it's like a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bake a loaf of bread and I'm going to take the weekend to do so. And she like in 45 minutes, she whips out a loaf of bread. The capacity within you to, to work and to work hard and to accomplish much in little time. She is eager to work. She is strong. She is vigorous. She is dignified. Again, Jesus saw this trait in women. And he engaged them in ministry because he saw Isha as strong and, and capable and, and eager. Number three, she is a visionary business person. It says that, that she, the passage says that she does not eat the bread of idleness. We don't really talk like that, but Eugene Peterson uh, paraphrased verse 27 this way. He said, 
she watches her household carefully and makes sure that everyone is carrying their load. Number four, she is generous, but she's generous in a tender way. You see it in how she takes care of, of her helpers and her employees. You see it in how she takes care of her children. There's not just a reluctant generosity, but there is a tenderness to her generosity. You see it in how she, she takes care of the poor, the, the nameless poor that are, that, are, that are mentioned in this passage. We don't know how well that she knows them. Perhaps they're even complete strangers, but she is generous toward them. We men tend to be reluctant in our generosity. We can be generous, but there's a reluctancy to it. But women, in general, seem to have a beautiful capacity to be generous, not out of duty or, or obligation, but rather out of tenderness, genuine compassion for the hurting. Often men in our generosity will be reluctant with an attitude that says, okay, I'll help you this time, but you better not get yourself into trouble again. You know, or I'm going to be, I'm going to be generous toward you, but I've got, I've got an expectation that you'll you know, set a bar, a high bar, at which you need to clear in order to validate my generosity. But, but the woman in this passage, she has a different air about her in her generosity. I see this in, in Jesus' life while he was on earth. He seemed to be generous at every turn with no reluctance. You're, you're like Jesus in that way. Number five, Isha, this woman, this wife, she blesses her husband always. Some of you don't have husbands. Some of you aren't. In fact, many of you don't. You're single. Some of you are married. Um, this wife, this woman, she blesses her husband. She brings him good. She does this always. She does this consistently. Now, in the culture that we live in, I can't really speak historically to how this translates into the culture of that day, but, but historically, in the culture that we live in, a culture that, that castigates men, which means it's, you chide and you belittle and you berate and you make fun of men. In, in that sort of context, this woman, she operated from a different playbook. It was important to her that that, 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 that she um, bless, that she esteem, that she encourage her husband. So, I, I, that's really all I have to say. I've, I've got, a, I've got a, a cl a closing, some closing thoughts here, but I wrote in this, in, this, uh, uh, in, in parentheses, I wrote, how does Jesus play into this? And I, I think I addressed this at the beginning when I said that, that left to ourselves, me as a man, you as a woman, we're not that honorable. We're, we're, we're not worth writing a paragraph of Scripture for. We, we often fail. Our, our, the, the image that we bear of, of, of the living God is tarnished and broken. But, but Jesus in your life brings about the opportunity to live full capacity, supercharged lives in which you can not check off a, 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 a list, all the boxes, are you like this lady, but rather it gives you the, the freedom, the, 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 the power to, to fully engage in whoever God has created you to be as a woman. I ask this question carefully and not to be answered out loud, are you seeking the right thing in life? And we're going to put this, this 
this uh, verse 30 up on the screen one more time. Are you seeking the right thing in life? Again, what this woman gets right is this, this, this ethic, this truth. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting, which means it's temporary. It will, you will, you will outlive your beauty because you are purpose-built for eternity. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Now, this woman, described in this passage, she is not seen as a hero in the eyes of society. This woman, she, she is not esteemed in today's culture. But, but this woman is a hero in God's eyes. This woman is esteemed in Proverbs 31. So, so I hope you read Proverbs 31 in that light. This is, this is, this is esteeming all the godly capacity that, that the Lord has placed in you. Final thought. It almost feels like an afterthought, but I wrote in my notes, I said, the woman is a warrior. Well, if you are a warrior, then there, there's got to be an enemy. Right? And so I, I wrote, she is a warrior doing battle with none other than Satan himself. Genesis chapter 3, God made it very clear. He spoke to, to Satan, and he said this, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Just embrace the fact that, that your boss may be annoying, but, but he's not your enemy. You're your husband may be annoying, but he's not your enemy. Your father, or your brother, your friend. And the same is true for us as men. You know. our, our enemy is Satan. And, and, and the real battle is a spiritual battle for our hearts and for our minds. We tend to, as human beings, try to choose up sides, and I'll be on... I'll be, you know, on the right, and you can be on the left, or I'll be on the north, and you can be on the south, or, I, you know, I'll, I'll be on the high, the high ground, you can be on the low ground, and, and we will do battle because you are my greatest enemy. And No, that is, that is not the ethic of Scripture. The ethic of Scripture is there is a battle going on, and it is a spiritual battle. And Satan, he, 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 what, what's, at, what's at stake is the, the, the very hearts and the very minds of, of the children of God. We're already the children of God. And, and Satan wants to rob you of that. And so in light of that, be a warrior. Isha, embrace all the capacity that God has given in you to, to, to fear Him, but to be fearless except for your fear of the Lord and to do battle with Satan himself on behalf of your family, on behalf of your children, or on behalf of your husband, on, on behalf of your, your, your girlfriends, on behalf of your community. Do battle. A, a strong woman, a wife of noble character, it, it, it is. It's hard to find, but, but God has put in you that capacity, so... In Christ, I pray that you would live up to that. Amen. Let us pray.